I have a close friend of mine who was one of my old law school roommates, and he's currently a managing partner at a large law firm in Allentown. And we were having a discussion some time ago about uh, the task that he undertakes in interviewing candidates for positions within the firm. And I was curious just what skills he was looking for when he was interviewing, and so I asked him, and he said, Father Pete, I look for passion, you know, almost in anything, and then it's our hope that we can direct that passion in fulfillment of our firm's mission. I think that is a great answer, and I think it points to what this Feast of Pentecost is all about, how by the power of the Holy Spirit, all of us are meant to possess this greatest passion, which is the passion to love God and to serve one another in his name. This event of the coming of the Spirit is recounted in our first reading from the Acts of the Apostles. This passage follows the preceding passage where the eleven had gathered together and prayed and they selected Matthias to succeed Judas. And now we hear again they are all in one place together. And here's a first and a most important insight. They are together. They are gathered as one. They must have this first and most fundamental passion to remain united in faith. And then we are told the Holy Spirit comes like a driving wind filling the entire house. And we are told that they were empowered to then speak in different tongues. And so this unity that they share is now extended to all that barrier of language difference, which is again symbolic of all that can separate and divide us, is shattered. And so this points to this deepest unity and community that the Spirit wants to effect in us. Indeed, the Holy Spirit accomplishes what is promised in our gospel when Jesus says he will send the advocate who will testify to him so that we can testify, all of us can glorify God in our lives of love and service. And so we see how all of this, our life of faith, our fulfillment of this mission that we have as disciples of Christ is only accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's only accomplished if we allow this power, this power that is the very person of God to fill us with passion. Are we enthusiastic when we come here each and every weekend? Do we really open our hearts to the transcendent reality of what it is we encounter here? Are we vibrant and passionate about our faith? Many of you have heard me say, either maybe in confession or in casual conversation or maybe in a homily before, that all negative thoughts come from Satan. This is not something I just make up and reiterate over and over. It's exactly what we hear about in today's second reading, in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. There he uses the term spirit and flesh, but he means a deeper reality, those actions, those thoughts, those feelings that you and I have, which necessarily either flow from the Spirit of God, which are His grace and His peace, or they flow from the one who is the prince of the world, the tempter, the one through whom sin has entered the world, who has come to wound and disrupt our flesh. What feelings seem to predominate in our lives? Is it anger? agitation, selfishness? Is it fear or insecurity or worry? Do we feel hopeless or helpless? None of these thoughts can come from God because none of these thoughts are in God. Or do we seek to maintain in our hearts the very spirit of the God who dwells in us his spirit of joy and love and peace. Amidst all those struggles and sufferings that are ours, do we hold on 
to that sense of consolation, mercy, and hope. I think I said it last year on this Feast of Pentecost. You know, we have the 12 gifts of the Holy Spirit, each one of them written in these panels on the side of our church. Do we ever just glance on those to meditate upon what the words mean? Generosity, kindness, joy, gentleness. These are ways in which the Spirit directs us to live, and they are dispositions that we are then meant to always have so that we will be happy. Jesus promised to send to us the Holy Spirit to guide us in all truth. The most basic expression of that truth is that you and I, each of us are priceless children of God, made in his image and likeness, adopted sons and daughters of our infinitely loving Father, weak, sinful, but forgiven, offered new life in Christ. We are called together to be one in the church, to know the power of that unity in his love. Our third Eucharistic prayer, it's one of the ones that I most frequently pray, contains these words right after the words of the consecration. The priest prays this. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. This is our identity and it is our destiny. This truth is always meant to animate us so that we can more fully become who we are, members of the mystical body of Christ. So what is our passion? <laughs> Whatever it is, let us see today what it is meant to be. The passion that is the very spirit of God filling us, strengthening us, and sustaining us. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and renew the face of the earth.